All right. So here we go, chapter one. All right, so we've already sort of introduced the general topic of statistics and we'll just say in general, we're often trying to answer some type of question like, should I go skydiving or should I get my dog's teeth cleaned? So I've got some other examples here. I'm gonna focus here on number three. Can mindfulness help increase academic performance in college students? So a practice of mindfulness. And if you haven't heard of that, um, you could sort of replace it for, uh, with the word meditation maybe. Would practicing meditation help students succeed in college? So basically what we're looking at in this case our population would be all members of a specific group. In this case, it would be all college students. Well, if I'm going to do a study, it would be really hard to recruit every single college student in the world. That's not gonna happen. That's a heck of a lot of students. And how would you ever get everybody to participate? But that's who I'm interested in. So your population is everybody in a group of interest, like all college students. All right, so a measurement obtained from a population is called a what? All right, so if I'm going to get information from a population, I can't do my college student example because I don't have a list of every college student in the world. So let me switch examples. I would like to do a study on students in this class. You have now become my population. And let's say I wanna know the average age of my students in this class. Well, that would not be too hard for me to do. I would just gather data from each of you and I would find the average. So if I collect data from everybody in a population, the number that describes that population is called a parameter. So that is our first vocabulary word. Parameters are numerical summaries of populations. So population parameters are often of interest. I wanna know something about my population. If I can do this, if I can collect data from every member of my population, such as yourselves, that process is called conducting a census. I am sure you've heard the word census before. So we'll just kind of briefly point out that the United States claims to do a census every 10 years. <laughs> claims, I say, because a census is getting data from everybody. I imagine you can think of people that sometimes get left out of census data collecting, such as anybody you can think of that might be difficult to include in a census when the United States Every 10 years, 2020 was our last census. Do you think everybody in the world, not world, US fill, filled out a form? Yeah, it was all landed. Homeless is tough, right? Contacting, how in the world would you even know if you contacted every homeless person? They're homeless, they don't have an address, right? It's hard to include them. So already I can tell you the United States has never done a census, ever. It's what they would like to do in a perfect world and we do our best, but there's no way to make sure that every person gets counted. Who else might we miss other than perhaps some homeless residents? You know, prisoners, I don't know how collecting data from prisoners works, but they must be included. Easier, so they're already, you know, you can... Yeah, it might actually be easier to get data from them, but I think more about that, yep. Undocumented, even if they wanted to fill out the census, might be hesitant, right? It could be tough. Yep. Yeah, I also don't know about that. How difficult is it for those living on reservations? Or, yeah, the, the proportion of people there that actually do get counted directly. Do you think anybody ever just throws out the form? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? So they actually hire people to go house to house for people that didn't fill out the form. So I'm just gonna do my quick blurb here of always complete the census. So the census, the counting of human beings in areas determines a lot of things like funding um, for like public facilities, for example. So the census is important and the United States tries, but in theory, it's 
not going to have, in theory, they'd like to, but the literal definition of census is you have to get data from everyone in your population. But what if you can't, like in the United States? Well, then there have to be techniques to try to estimate characteristics of your population. And that's where the statistics side comes in. All right, so if we can't collect data from everybody, sometimes it's just costly, timely, practical. Um, what we do is we rely on samples. So when we take a sample, it's a subset of our population and our sample up here is a subset of the people of interest and they are supposed to represent your population. So a sample, um, why does it have to represent your population? Well, if it didn't, then it wouldn't reflect your population. So for example, Let's say my population is all LBCC students. So every student taking classes this semester is my population of interest. And I would like to do a study on whether or not students feel comfortable returning to campus. And I don't have time to include every student in my study. So I'm gonna do something called a convenience sample. This is not a good idea, but I'm going to do a convenient sample. It means I'm going to do something easy and I'm a little lazy. I don't feel like thinking too hard. So you all are my sample. I'm going to see if I can get data from you and then tell the school whatever you think reflects what everybody at LBCC thinks. So would you that are sitting here in a face to face class be a good representation of every student taking classes at LBCC regarding the question, are you comfortable coming back to class? Right, I mean, it's kind of, this is really obvious, right? That you're here. So you don't reflect the views of this whole student body necessarily. You're probably more likely comfortable coming back to campus because you're here. So statistics goes all wrong if you use the wrong sample to draw a conclusion about your population. So you would be biased towards comfortableness in returning to campus, most likely, maybe not individually, but as a group. All right, but that's the goal. Try to take a sample that represents your population and draw a conclusion based on that. Now, when you take your sample and describe the sample, it's not called a parameter because parameters describe your whole population. If we only rely on a sample, that number is called a statistic. So if we only use a sample, those values that describe samples are called statistics. Yep. All right, so I kind of remember the S's go together. If you only rely on a sample describing that, its number is called a statistic. So S's statistics describe samples and P parameters are numbers that describe populations. So that will be our first step is identifying. So you do not have to write a vocabulary word definition. You just have to apply it, which is what we're about to do. So, Rita is a stats keeper for the local youth, local youth soccer league. At the end of the season, she calculates a pass accuracy of 57%. And Rita based that on a random group of 25 players. In contrast, the pass accuracy for all players in the league was 68%. So maybe Rita didn't have time to get data from everybody. So she just looked at 25 players, but they do have information on the whole population. So the numbers aren't the same, but this would be the best that Rita could do to figure out what's happening in the league. All right, based on those players. So identify the population. So, all is a great word to remember for populations. It would be everybody of interest. So it would be all of the players in the league. 
So all players in the league would be our population. So our sample would be our subset. And that would be Rita there who looked at just 25 players in the league. So I'll just say the 25 players in the, ran, um, the random group of 25 players. And it says random because Rita doesn't want to be biased and maybe only choose the best players. So random means that she just picked players in a way that everybody had the same chance of being in her study. All right, so the pass rate of 57% for the 25 players. So the 57% here described just the sample. So that number is called a statistic. So statistics describe samples. Versus the pass rate of 68%, that was after collecting data from all of the players, the population. So 68% is called a parameter. And so these are the kind of questions you'll see on Alex. They'll just say, hey, is this a parameter? Is this a statistic, et cetera? So let me give you guys a chance to read and try the next one. Let's see how you do. Here. All right, so for Linda and her blog, our population of interest would be all of her subscribers. And if you put the specific number, that's fine too. Um, I'll put the specific number. So on Alex, all 11,212 subscribers. So I think on Alex, you'll see it sort of in reverse. They'll say, all the subscribers and you'll say, hey, that's the population. So just identifying how these words apply. And then the sample would be the ones that she pulled. So the 500 subscribers, that would be our subset. So anything like that is fine. Just getting the idea there. And then the 3.4 comments per blog, and that was for all of the subscribers. So that's your parameter, right? So all is a good way to know that we're talking about our population up there. So that value is called a parameter. And then the 67% of the people polled that liked at least one of her blogs, that was the number that came from her sample. So that's called a statistic. And as the course progresses, we'll learn that there's different symbols for parameters versus statistics as we, you'll start to see as we get rolling. Okay. So, The first half of our semester will be what we call descriptive statistics, where we basically learn to just summarize data, maybe present it in a graph, or just describe it numerically. And then the second half of the semester is going to be where we learn to use samples to draw conclusions about populations, and that is called inferential statistics. So. I want to just point out here this idea of inferential statistics by bringing up one of my examples that we have not looked at yet, though I have mentioned brushing teeth. So this is a study not too long ago. Um, nearly 70% of dog parents have never brushed their dog's teeth. 
so when we read things um, in the news or anywhere, and they say things with such authority, like they know that this is true, there's a tendency to believe it, right? Nearly 70% of dog parents have never brushed their dog's teeth. All right, the reality is, did they gather data from every single dog parent? Right, that's not possible. The population is huge. There's no way to include every person in the study. They didn't ask me, and I had Chester in 2020. So they missed me, so that answer can't be true. It can't be accurate 100% because I didn't gather data from the population. So when you read these numbers about anything, you need to remember that, take everything with a grain of salt because it's just a study based on a subset. And we hope that they took a sample that represents the population. So this study was done on about a thousand dog parents but let me show you a way that this could be biased and I wouldn't know unless I asked them how they conducted their research. So this is the percent that they found in their study of 1000 dog owners, the of parents who have never brushed their dog's teeth. So what if the thousand people they included, all 1000 of them were dog owners that make more than half a million dollars a year? Not every dog owner, only the people that are, I'm going to call that, in my opinion, that's super wealthy, <laughs> super wealthy. So what might be different about super wealthy dog parents compared to not? Yeah, you think they might take better care of their dogs? Just maybe as a group, Just, yeah, time, knowledge, maybe they hire their butler to do it. I don't know. <laughs> what was that? Availability. Oh, yeah. Availability and time. Right. So that would be a biased study because they didn't make an effort to include people from different economic backgrounds. Right. So all of these things that you read and see, you need to remember, you know, there's more I would like to know before I believe this number necessarily. And to also know that even if they do their study perfectly, samples aren't perfect. They're subsets. So it's the best we can do but we just need to understand that there are problems that come with this idea of using samples. All right, so we will learn all of these different techniques on collecting data and hoping it represents, is not biased, um, so we can draw reasonable conclusions. So that's our next step. Let's see if we look at this example, town officials want to estimate the number of households in the town that own a dog. All right, so our population, they're interested in all of these households in their town. So all households. But gathering data from all of them might be quite time consuming and you'd have to hire people to do it, it's costly. So instead, they would like to use a sample to try to get an estimate for that number. And it is, which of the following would probably best represent the population? All right, so these are gonna be kind of obviously biased, um, but we're just trying to kind of get through the point here. Um, one here, 25 households with a backyard are selected and 15 of them owned a dog. So would picking households with a backyard be a popular, be a sample that represents all households in town, right? Clearly not, right? Just people with a backyard. And would people with the backyard maybe be more likely to have dogs, right? They've got the space, that kind of thing. So it's clearly biased, right? If you're trying to represent your town, you can't pick people just with backyards. What about people that live in apartments or whatever, people in houses without backyards? So totally biased, no go. That would not be a reasonable study of your town. And I'm gonna to go to the last or the third one here. 25 households were picked that live within a mile of a park, right? Again, so biased, right? You're trying to represent your town. So you don't want to pick people just living near parks. Maybe they have more money or it's more likely to have a dog. Whatever the case, the idea is we want to represent our town. 
All right, so my best case would be random, right? Just randomly pick, totally unbiased. And that would be our best way to represent what's going on in this town. So if we go with this sample, now they tell us there are 450 households in town and I wanna find an estimate for the number of households that own a dog. So this is statistics. I don't wanna to go to every house, but I wanna figure out how many have dogs to the best of my ability. And right now that's based on these 25 houses. All right, so based on this study here, seven out of 25 own a dog. So that's our proportion that we reviewed. So that fraction of 450 will give me my estimate. So we can do seven divided by 25 of is multiply. And I will show you how I enter that on my calculator. So basically you can just type seven divided by 25 times 450. So again, I don't use fraction buttons. Some calculators have them, but we can just do division and then multiply and I'm getting 126 as my estimate. So based on my sample, I estimate that 126 households own a dog. That is probably not correct exactly but it's the best we can do relying on the sample we took. Okay, so I'm gonna just get us through this next one here kind of quickly, because again, these will be sort of obvious. If I'm doing a study on LBCC wants to know, estimate the number of faculty who drive to school. So the population of interest are all the faculty Right, so all LBCC faculty, everybody in our group. And the biased ones are gonna be pretty obvious. So if you're studying all faculty, should you pick 20 faculty from the English department, <laughs> right? Uh, no, those are biased towards English department people. Right, so you just have to think about who we're trying to represent. Or how about picking just full time faculty? No, they didn't say they were doing a study on full time faculty. They said they were doing a study on faculty. So that would be biased towards full time faculty. So basically, for these questions, you are going for the ones that are just random. Right, so randomly picking a number. All of us faculty have IDs. They could just randomly pick IDs and those people would be included. And in this case, 20. All right, so based on that sample, 16 out of the 20 drive to school. And they tell us there are 970 faculty members at LBCC. I did look this up last year and it was about 970 which also surprised me. I didn't know we had that many faculty, but it's full-time and part-time. So basically I just need to figure out that fraction out of 970, and that will be my estimate for the number who drive to school. So again, I'll just type it in as division and then multiply. So I'm gonna estimate 776 faculty drive to school. All right, so that's the basic idea, representative samples and trying to avoid bias. So we've already talked about bias a bit here, but I'm going to just sort of mention that there's basically two things that can go wrong, two categories in statistics that can happen. One is called sampling error and the other is non-sampling. So basically sampling error just means we all get that samples aren't perfect. Everybody knows to understand that there is always room for error when you don't collect data from everybody in your population. So that's to be expected. Non-sampling error is basically everything else. And it's kind of like human beings messing up. 
somehow being biased, um, or maybe it's just bad wording on a survey, um, or um, we talked about social desirability bias. I kind of like recall bias. There was a survey I read about, um, it was about nutrition and it said something like, how many cups of coffee did you have last week? So recall bias would be me not recalling it correctly, right? I don't know, 10, 12, 103. <laughs> um, so that's the basic idea. So we won't have to worry too much about this part identifying it, but I just want you to realize mistakes happen and some are expected, and then some are just human errors. All right, now, let me um, pause here for just a second. So, so we're gonna go on to collecting data, and that data can fall into different categories. And we start with the difference between what we call a quantitative variable versus a categorical variable. So for example, if I was collecting data on the number of students in a class, that is a quantity. So quantitative data, we call it quantitative, but you can think of it as numerical. So in statistics, there's often more than one word for the same thing, and it's just based on your teacher and the book you're using. So we will call it quantitative data, represents a number like, the weight of a student or the square feet in a classroom, the height of a student, basically something that's a number versus you might be studying something that falls into a category. So it's called categorical data. So a category is like a label or a name. So for example, um, level of education completed like graduate degree or bachelor's degree religious affiliation, so just a name or a label, your eye color or your favorite brand of cereal. So in algebra, variables tended to represent numbers. In statistics, they can represent numbers, but I could also say let X equal your eye color, and then it would be called categorical. Now, other books call it instead of categorical, they call it qualitative, like it's a quality of something. I personally prefer qualitative, but too bad. <laughs> we go with categorical because that's the way our book labels it. So again, sometimes there's different words for things. So before I go further, I just wanna go through these examples and indicate if it's a quantity or a category, if we were studying the number of quizzes taken this semester. So that's a number. <laughs> Quantitative, this will be pretty simple, you guys. So numbers are quantities. So I'll abbreviate later here, but for the first one, quantitative. And then I'll just write Q after this. And the volume of coffee in ounces in a cup dispensed by a coin operated coffee machine. Quantitative, a number. So sometimes there's more than you need in the sentence. This word volume is a number. All that other stuff is fluff here in terms of what's the type of variable. Volume of anything would be a number. So we'll just write Q now for quantitative. And then the condition of a used textbook, poor, good, or excellent. Categorical, right? It's just a label or a name. So categorical, and I'll write it out the first time and then we'll abbreviate here. So again, you don't have to write the definition of a word. You just have to do what we're doing here and identify it. All right, so in an experimental study, the participants estimate for the height of a three meter object, three meter image projected 12 meters away. That's a lot of words. <laughs> Height, right? Estimate height. Height would be quantitative. It's a number. All right. Your major, categorical, just a name. Number of languages spoken, quantitative number. The primary language spoken, 
categorical. So a name, um, employees commute distance, a number like five miles from school, social security number, So here's the deal. <laughs> when we say quantitative, numerical, we mean numbers that we do math with in a meaningful way, right? So your social security number, we don't do math with them, right? Like if you take my social security number and divide by two, you don't get two little me's, right? It doesn't, it's not relevant here. Your social security number is not a number. They, right, they call it a number, but it's really just a label or an identifier for you, right? Instead of saying, hey, Professor Hartford, you say, hey, 200, blah, blah, blah. I probably shouldn't put my social security number on a recording. Now, <laughs> mine starts with 200 because I was born in Philadelphia. I think in the beginning, the numbers at the start indicated the region you were born in, maybe. Yeah, so it means something, but it's not a number you do math with. All right, I am from Pennsylvania originally, and I have to tell you, it's freaking me out that it's February and it's like 80 something degrees. <laughs> Back home, it's freezing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's February. And I'm like, ready to go to the beach. Okay, so I'm on an aside, of course. All right, so social security numbers are just labels for you. It's a category. Okay. So for this page, I'm done with categorical. We're not gonna break it down further. So I'm just Xing out, I'm done with these, but we're gonna deal with the quantities and discuss how we can further differentiate quantitative variables into one of two types. So I'm gonna go back up here. Quantitative variables are classified as either discrete or continuous. So the way to think about it, a variable that's discrete means that it's kind of in chunks, like you count them. So the number of people in this room, I would count you, that's discrete. Each of you is an individual object, so to speak, versus a value that is from a continuous data type. You can think of it like a tape measure. It's something that you would measure. So, like the length of my height, for example, I would measure how tall I am, right? You can't count different heights. It, it's something that we would measure. And another way to think of this, it says that things that are continuous take on any value between two specified values. So there are an infinite number of possible values. All right. So for example, if I was counting cars and one day there were 54 cars in the parking garage and the next day there were 55, that would be discrete. If I'm counting cars, each car is an individual item. But what if I go back to age? If this were 54 years old and this were 55 years old, Aren't there numbers in between, like 54 and a half? Or I could be 54 years, 10 months, three days, two hours, and six seconds. There's infinitely many possibilities between any two numbers. Now, it might not be the way we speak, right? We usually speak in years. When we're older, when babies are little, they speak in months, like a two-month or a three-month-old. So it's not about how we speak. It's about what's possible. If there's numbers possible between two numbers, that's going to be your continuous. So in my opinion, the easiest way to remember it is if you count it, it's discrete, and then the other ones are continuous, because counting is a little bit more obvious to us. So let's try the first one. If you had to know the number of quizzes you were taking, you would count them, right? It literally says number. So if it says number of anything, you already know it's discrete because you're counting. So that is the deal. Discrete will probably jump out at you quickly. Continuous, I don't know, we'll find out. So if you were measuring volume of coffee, 
actually, I just said the word measure, so that kind of blew it. But if you measure, it's continuous. So let me try an example. When I get stuck, this is what I say to myself. It says volume in ounces. I pick two numbers. So let me say 16 ounces of coffee, 17 ounces of coffee. Now, I know they say ounces, maybe we're talking in ounces, but is it possible to have 16 and a half ounces? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, you guys. I think I just moved in a way that the light, like you can't tell. I felt like the room just like changed, but that light like shot me in the eyeball. <laughs> I'm moving over this way a little bit. It's, did the room change to you guys? No. Something that projector's broken. That's what changed. It, okay, hold on. I can't see. I just got blinded, literally. Um, see, and this is why I need to stop my recording. Um, dang, I seriously have light glare. There's more light on it. No, it, it's like that. It just, uh, I know you guys can't see it, but it just flared. Like it's not focused anymore, but to you, it still looks focused, right? Mm -hmm. I've got spots in my eyes now. I can't see. Can I get hazard pay? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I'll have them fix that. I'm going to slide over here and try to continue here. That was strange, though. All right. Dang. Is it still recording me? No. Are you sure you want to stop? Yes, it is. I think. Oh, oh no, because you didn't, you didn't pause it. You stopped it. Oh, all right. We'll find out. <laughs> oh, oh, is that what happens? So if I hit cancel, will it keep recording? Yeah. All right, I'll try that. Okay. What are we talking about? Coffee? Coffee? <laughs> yes, there are ounces between 16 and 17. Okay, so continuous. I'm just going to abbreviate. All right, so height. I know there's a lot of other words, but is height measured or counted? Measured, measured right? Again, you can think of two numbers like five feet tall, six feet tall, but you could be 5.3 feet tall. Always numbers in between if possible, continuous. Okay, and then the number of languages spoken in a household. Discrete, right? You'd count them like two languages or three languages are spoken. You can't speak 2.8 languages. Like it doesn't make any sense. All right, discrete. I'll do a D here, discrete. Um, and then distance of anything. like five miles from school or six miles from school. So I could be five and a half miles, right? Or five and three quarter miles. So we measure distance. So there's different ways to think of it. So that makes it continuous. Okay. So for some people this clicks immediately and for others, I know from experience, you need more practice and it is one more level or type of thing we need to do in terms of data. And so we're gonna kind of switch gears and talk about data in a slightly different way. And these are called levels of measurement. Now, in my little flow chart here, data, um, it says we start with either qualitative or quantitative. So I'm just going to remind you that for us, quantitative is what I'm sorry qualitative is what we're calling categorical so those are the same thing so basically starting with categorical we break it into either what we call nominal or ordinal data so these first two are the categorical ones and then we'll talk about these two together these two are the quantitative ones and they're kind of a hierarchy. They sort of get more involved as we go down. 
but they kind of keep passing on their traits. So we'll see what that sort of means as we go through. So nominal and ordinal are categories. And the easiest way to think of it is to start with ordinal. So ordinal, the word order, means that there's a ranking to the values, the names. So for example, so let me start with ordinal. If I gave you shirt sizes, extra small, small, medium, large, those are in order of size, right? There's an order describing how big they are. Or um, coffee temperature, if I judged it hot, warm, cold, right? That's an order, decreasing temperature. Um, with the Olympics going on, Olympic medals are ordinal, gold, silver, bronze, first, second, third. So if it's not ordinal, and it's a category, the other option would be nominal. So I remember nominal starts with N. It means it's just a name. It has no ordering. It's just simply a name. There's not one that's better than another. They're not ranked. They're just a bunch of names. So for example, dog breeds. So I've had a bunch of dog breeds, pug, poodle, collie. A collie is no better than a pug, right? These aren't ranked. They're just names. Um, college majors, right? A business major is no better than a psychology major. <laughs> They're just names of majors. I think you'll find those pretty simple. Now, ordinal means that there's an ordering. So both of the next two, there's an ordering. So that's what I mean about passing on traits from the previous. So here's the deal. Interval scale and ratio are both examples of quantitative data, numerical data. But the interval scale is like the Likert scale I gave you on the survey that we filled out. And the deal with interval scale, it's gonna feel weird. When a number is on an interval scale, it means that zero doesn't indicate there's none of that quantity present, which is kind of weird because zero usually means there's none of something, but not in the interval case. So easiest example to give you is temperature. I've got my thermometer here and I'm gonna go with Celsius, zero degrees Celsius. Does that mean there is no temperature? right? That's just silly, right? There is temperature. It just happens to be really cold, right? Zero degrees is when water freezes. I don't know if we're aware of that, but zero degrees Celsius, this is when water freezes. So why is zero degrees Celsius when water freezes? Well, because some dude said so, right? Like, Interval means mankind, womankind, personkind, just made it up. Zero degrees, everybody wants to communicate basically. So as human beings, in order to communicate, we have to make some agreements and somebody decided we're all gonna agree zero degrees Celsius will be when water freezes. It's like a marker. It's not a literal no temperature. It just allows us to speak to one another. Next example is calendar year, right? This is 2022, why? There's no reason for it whatsoever, except we as human beings wanted to talk to each other. And in your world, it can't be 1912, in my world, 2022, we don't get to just pick our own starting point. So somebody decided somewhere along the way in the Gregorian calendar that we were gonna set things up. And I'll go from a religious perspective does anybody know what zero was based on? Year zero? Yeah, the birth of Christ was that turning point in that calendar. So these days, we instead of calling it before Christ, BC, before the common era. Yeah, so they were trying to sort of remove the religious component to it from it. And you're welcome to like read all about calendar years, but basically we had to decide how to communicate. So very few things are interval. Interval means that zero is an indicator of a point, but it doesn't mean there's none of the quantity. And sometimes there's not even a zero on the scale and we'll see that too. Otherwise numbers are ratio level. 
ratio level is pretty much everything with unusual exceptions like temperature. So ratio level zero does mean none. So if I told you I own zero cats, it literally means no cats, right? So that would be ratio. Or if I get in my car and I'm going zero miles per hour, it means that there is no movement. So zero means zero. All right, so we'll give these a try and we will start with flower type. So rose, carnation, tulip, et cetera. So it's a name. I can't get this all on the same page. It's a name. Yeah, and there's no ranking, right? Carnations aren't better than roses. And it can't be your personal opinion. It has to just be inherent to the flowers. So it's just the name of a flower, so nominal. Now your credit score, I don't know if you keep track of your credit score, but one of the common credit scores like Experian, here's my credit score picture. Your credit score is a number from 300 to 850. So it's a number, right? Okay, so it's a number. And then you ask yourself, does zero mean you have no credit score? There is no zero, right? So you guys, credit scores are just made up humankind, right? We as human beings decided to judge each other based on our credit. So we said 300, 850 or whoever picked it. There's not even a zero. So if there's no zero at all, even in the scale, it's definitely interval, right? So anything that humankind created is interval like picking something so we could communicate like our credit scores. So there's no zero at all. That's the interval level. Yep. So why is it not ordinal? Oh, good question. So it is ordinal plus it's also a number. So as you go down, they kind of pass on characteristics. So when I say kind of hierarchy, these are names. These are names with an order. These are numbers with an order. So it, it is ordinal, but it has the added component of being a number. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question because that always comes up at some point somewhere. So interval does come in order, but it's also a number. Okay. Now let's switch it up. What if I said credit score, but this time reported as bad, fair, good, or excellent? Now it's ordinal, right? It's a name. So it's context of the question that can matter. But if we're talking about names, that's in order based on your goodness of credit. All right, volume in liters of water Ratio sounds good because it's a number. And zero literally means no water. Like, I don't think it's going to rain anything today. It will rain zero liters of water today. No, no water. So numbers are typically ratio with few exceptions. So usually zero means zero. All right, your political affiliation. Nominal is the name, like independent, Republican, Green Party, etc. Just the name. No rankings. All right, t shirt sizes, ordinal. Duration of a phone call. So it's a number for sure, right? Okay, so then you say zero minutes. The zero minutes mean there was no length of the call. Yeah, I hung up on my mom yesterday. The call lasted zero minutes. <laughs> so zero does mean zero. So it's kind of hard. Sometimes students will overthink it and say, but how could a phone call last zero minutes? And don't overthink it. Just say, does zero mean zero? Yes, it does. 
Yeah, so I know it's a little trickier um, ratio. All right, number of eggs in an omelet. So it's a number. Does zero eggs mean there are no eggs? Yes, that's what zero means. So again, don't overthink it. Students will say, but how could I have an omelet with no eggs? I'm like, I don't know, don't care. No eggs means no eggs. <laughs> Maybe it's a tofu omelet. Like we could go down all sorts of crazy winding roads here. But if somebody said, I ate zero eggs yesterday, you would say, oh, you didn't eat any eggs. <laughs> what was that? Vegan eggs. Vegan eggs. Okay, telephone number. <laughs> All right, so first, telephone numbers, are they numbers? Right, so do we do math with telephone numbers? No. Right, we don't add them. I mean, you could, but it would be silly, right? When we say numbers, we mean numbers that math makes sense. So telephone numbers are not numbers, right? They're just labels for your phone. That's so your social security number. Instead of using your phone number, you could say, call Fred. My phone is named Fred, call him. And then we put a number on it. So it's just a label for your phone. Okay, so now we know it's a category and our phone numbers ranked. Is there an ordering like first, second, third, right? My number is no better than yours. It's just an, an identifier. So telephone numbers, it's actually nominal. It's just an identifier, a label for your phone. And there's no ranking to them. There's no ordering to them. All right, SAT scores range from 200 to 800 on the math portion. It's a number and there's no zero interval. It would, yeah, humankind picked SAT scales here, right? So they decided that when you take the SAT, you're guaranteed to get a number between 200 and 800. They didn't even include zero on the scale, probably because that would be mean. Nobody wants to have an aptitude of zero, right? That just sounds bad. <laughs> I don't know why they chose it, but that would be interval, a number, but zero doesn't have meaning. It doesn't even exist on the scale. Okay, so the last thing, at least the last big thing we need to do then, we're done sort of identifying types of data. Now that we've talked about getting data from an entire population can be tough, if not impossible, we rely on samples. And we want our samples to be unbiased. And so it can get complicated on how can we do that. So we go through what we call sampling techniques. And we'll start with what I just like to call names in a hat. So for example, if I at the end of class today have three puppies upstairs, and I want to give three of you a puppy, and I want to be fair, and three people out of all of you would be a sample. What I could do is take all your names and put them in a hat and shuffle my hat and then pick out three names. All, everybody would have the same chance of getting a puppy. And in particular, any three of you would have the same chance. So that's called simple random sampling. Now I'll just point out here, random without the simple, random means I'd pick one of you. Simple random means picking more than one. It doesn't matter to me. You can just call it random, <laughs> but there is a slight difference. So when we say simple random, it means any group has the same chance of being selected. Okay, that would be lovely if you could do it, but I couldn't do that with all dog owners in the United States because I don't know all of their names to put in a hat. So you can't always take a random sample. So next approach, you could use something called a systematic sample in some cases. So systematic would mean you create an interval and you include those subjects. So for example, if somebody is walking down a street 
and they don't want to stop at every house because that would take forever. They decide to stop at every third house. That's called a systematic sample. When we're done today, if everybody goes through that door and I stop every fifth person to ask a question, that's a system, systematic. We do not have to get into more detail. Like, why did you pick every third person? Or why did you pick every fifth person beyond the scope of this course? We're just trying to recognize the technique. Okay. The next two are the most common source of confusion because they feel similar. So we're gonna look at a stratified random sample versus a cluster random sample. They both involve randomness, but what makes them special is that they're both based on forming groups. So let me start with stratified. So what we do is we break our population into groups based on a shared characteristic. Each group is called a stratum, plural is strata, beyond what we care about. I'm just giving you some vocabulary. We can just think of them as groups. So these groupings, and the idea here is that by breaking a population into groups, we don't leave anybody out. So before I do my example on paper, let me do an example in this room. Could you raise your hand if you're a psychology major? One, two, three, four, five, six, about six people. How about nursing majors? One, two, three, four, five, six, that's about the same. How about um, business? About four. They're all about the same. What other majors are out there? Accounting? One person. What other majors are out there in the room? Criminal justice. Criminal justice. How many criminal justice? I like two. Okay, two. I'm looking for a good example. So we've got two criminal justice majors, but I have about seven psychology majors. All right. So if I wanted to pick three people from the room, wouldn't, it, wouldn't the psychology major being included have a better chance because there's more of them? There, right, there'd be a chance of leaving out criminal justice because there's only two of them. So that's not always what you want. When you do a study, sometimes you want to make sure that there's equal representation of all of the groups of interest. So I think that there are maybe more women in this room than men, I'm not sure. But if I was going to randomly pick people and there was only one woman in the room and everybody else was men, I can't just pick at random. I would probably miss the woman if there's only one of them. I'd be missing people. So stratified means group people based on a common characteristic and then make sure to pick people from every group so nobody gets left out. I would be guaranteed to pick a criminal justice person because they'd be in their group and I'd pick one of them to be in my study. All right, I did it with generations, I think, like Gen X, if you want to do a study on generations and not leave anybody out. All right, so what's cluster? Cluster sampling, you still make groups, but in this method from the groups, you pick some people from every one of the groups so nobody's left out. So I call this sum from all. So sum from all. Or sum from each. My, just my short way of remember it, remembering. Nobody gets left out, whether you're a baby boomer or a Gen X, millennial, whatever the case. And we don't worry about how many people to pick from each group beyond what we worry about, just kind of the general idea. All right, versus cluster, I've got groups. But now they're not based on a shared characteristic, they're just groupings. So that's why these dots are different colors here. So usually um, the easiest way to think about this is looking at a geographic region that's quite large. So I'm just gonna go with LA County and pretend that we've got a lot of farms, probably not so much in LA County, but I'm gonna go with it. So let's say I'm studying LA County and there was a time when it was farmland. So what if I wanna visit farms and this whole thing is LA County? Well, if I wanna visit farms, traveling all of LA County would be kind of tough. It's a big county, right? And if there's all these different locations to go through, that would be expensive to do that study, It'd take a lot of time. 
So what I would do instead, I would break the county up into six regions, like this is the west, northwest. Here's the northwest, southeast, right? I have these regions in the county. And then instead of going to all of them, I would randomly pick two of those regions. And when I get there, I will go to every farm. So I would go to every farm, but only from some of the chosen regions. So I call this one all from just some. So I would go to all farms from just some of the selected region, regions. regions. So randomness is involved, but the key is to look at it and say, I made groups. And did I pick some from all the groups? Or did I pick just a couple groups and take everybody? Now, I kind of know if you see the difference with the following example. So tomorrow is the Super Bowl. And let's say you're having a Super Bowl party. I'm having a Super Bowl party. And I'm going to send you to the grocery store to buy me lots of grapes because I want a whole bunch of grapes for my party. And just pretend they're all green grapes. So you get to the store and you're looking at the display of grapes and I want you to buy a whole lot of them. But I'm gonna make you buy my grapes in one of two methods. You can use the stratified method or you can use the cluster method. One of those methods is gonna have people stopping and looking at you like you are crazy. Which method of buying grapes would make you look a little bit out of place in the world. Yeah, let's see. Let me let me buy grapes like this, right? Here's the display, and you know all the bags where the grapes come in clusters. Mm -hmm. So you would stand at the grocery store. You'd open the first bag, take two grapes. Open the second bag, take two grapes. Open the third bag, take two grapes. right? You'd open every bag and take two grapes. You're gonna look crazy. So how do we really buy grapes in the real world? In clusters, don't they even call them clusters, mm -hmm. right? You take the whole bag, mm -hmm. that's generally what we do. So that's my suggestion on how to remember it, right? So think of those two pictures when we do problems. And then cluster, you take everybody in the group that you randomly pick. All right, the fourth method is called convenience. And it's the easy one because convenience means you put no thought into it whatsoever. You just do whatever's simple. So if I made you my sample of LBC students, that's convenient. It's not really representative necessarily, but it's easy for me to do. Every internet survey is a convenience sample. Nobody makes you answer internet surveys. You choose to do it. There was no study trying to get an equal representation of people necessarily. Um, so convenience is just simple, easy, but there's no real design to it um, in terms of giving thought to a representative sample. So I will just mention, because we do have psychology majors in the room, that it's really common for professors to use their own students as their subjects. Right. This can be kind of problematic because then you're only studying college students. So your kind of conclusions would only apply to college students. So if you wanted to study people aged 18 to 25 and only used college students, you'd be leaving out anybody not in college. So that can be troublesome, um, but they can be useful at times. And then in the real world, it gets way more complicated, you guys. We usually do combining techniques and um, it can get much more involved, but we will focus on those and can you identify them? So let's try the first one. All right, so I'll give you the methods and I just wrote random for simple random. So this is my names in a hat. Systematic is when you do an interval, like every fourth or every fifth or every sixth subject. And then we've got these two, which are the main source of confusion because they're both involving groups. So we need to be careful with them. And then convenience is usually kind of obvious. All right, so if you're looking at something that's grouped, you know it'll be one of those. 
Okay, so number one, a facility supervisor at a sports stadium wants to rate the condition of seats at the stadium. The supervisor forms groups of 20 seats based on the sections the seats are in. And then she selects all the seats from four randomly chosen groups. So as you can imagine in a huge stadium, maybe they don't wanna look at every single seat. That would be tedious and time consuming. All right, so we've got groups. So she selects all seats in four groups. So here's the stadium, right? Here's the stadium. They pick four groups and go to all those seats versus this would be from every single section they look at two seats right they look at every section and some of the seats so this is cluster right it's all the seats from some of the sections So a student of mine one semester, the way it helped him remember it, the random part is picking the groups. If the picking the groups is the random part, it's going to be cluster. If the random part is the subjects, it'll be stratified. So let's see, if we, it's easier to look at it as a difference. So number two, so in a study on intercollegiate sports at a university, researchers identified 26 intercollegiate teams, five athletes are randomly selected from each of those teams. So they're picking some players from all of the teams. Okay, so they're picking some from all that is your stratified. So the random is the subjects that are picked, right? So you can add any of your own notes that you would like. The subjects are selected at random. For the cluster, the groups were selected at random. So there's all sorts of different ways to think of it. I personally like all from some and some from all but adding on to that, anything that helps you identify it. Okay, so number three, from a fishbowl of business cards in a restaurant, five cards are selected each month and these patrons get a free dessert on their next visit. So I'm gonna go with random. It will probably, simple random is better, but random is fine. I just wanna add though. So random, it's like names in a hat. Could you see somebody making an argument that it's also convenience? Like do you make people put a business card in that bowl or can people just put it in if they want? I don't know, have you ever been to a restaurant and somebody said you have to be in my bowl or my fishbowl or whatever they put out? <laughs> so you guys, I can see sometimes arguments can be made that it's both. It was convenient to put out a fishbowl, right? That's a convenient sample. 
But then after you have the business cards, it's random because you're picking people and everybody has the same chance. Okay, so random is what I'm gonna go with here. Number four, every eighth person in line to speak to an unemployment representative is interviewed by a researcher. That's your systematic. If it's an interval, every eighth person, 10th person, 12th person, anything that sets up an interval is your system. So systematic. All right, so I'm gonna be quiet for a second and let you try the last few here. And we'll see how we do. 